Hey everybody, how you doing? I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins, and uh, welcome to the Black Business School. And I'm here with uh, with 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 my new my new homie, uh, Mr. Daryl Bell, who is uh, an actor, producer, writer, and as he says, above average golfer. Uh, you've probably seen him on on major shows, of course, a different world, but but he's done so much more. Uh, and first thing I want to say is uh, to my brother, how you doing today, man? I'm well, Dr. Watkins, and how are you on this fine Mother's Day Sunday? I'm doing real well. I'm real, real well, man. I think I'm going to check out some of the games. You mentioned some good games on today, so I think I might take some time and watch some games myself. Yeah, so, so you, in other words, you're going to ask me questions real quick, and you want me to be real brief. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 interpret it as you may, but you know, you, you're the you're the person, you're the guest of honor. <laughs> you, you're, you're the guy that I want I want people to hear from, and I I think just so you know, I think there's a little bit of a lag um, in, in terms of uh, uh, when you speak versus when I speak. So I'll uh, I'll try to I want people to know that in yeah. case it sounds like we end up talking over each other a little bit. But okay, first and foremost. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I would, I know a lot of people would probably ask the question that I might have asked uh, when I first met you. I met you maybe a few weeks ago. Uh, my brother introduced us, um, and it was funny because uh, he, he said, "Oh yeah, you, you should, you should sit down with Daryl. It'd be a great conversation." And I said, "Okay, you know." And then we talked. We talked for like three hours, uh, and we talked about you know so many things outside of entertainment. Even though entertainment was in there a little bit, but it was mostly about issues that uh, you know as far as you know as black men, the black community. Is center of business, um, and I was really impressed with, with your wealth of knowledge. Uh, and so first question I want to start with is, can you talk about some of the things that you've done since, uh, you know, since you did A Different World in the, in the early, uh, I guess we ended in the early 90s. Uh, what's your life been like since that time? What have you been up to? That, that's a great question, and there's a long answer to that. And I mean, A Different World went off the air in 1994, so there's a lot of explaining it to fill in that gap. But suffice it to say that when A Different World went off the air, immediately what I was doing is my father was the first African-American member of the New York Stock Exchange. And while I was filming A Different World, he passed away. So even while I was shooting A Different World, I was by Coastal uh, overseeing the, the management of the broker-dealer as well as the chocolate manufacturing firm that we own. So from – and that was in my early 20s. Um, you know, my dad was evangelical about the need for the African-American community to take control of their economic power. And he always felt that, as a general rule, black people are consumers, not producers. Part of what kept the black community outside of the mainstream of economic power was their access to capital, which is why he became an investment banker and also wanted to pursue the ownership of a commercial bank to try to alleviate some of those pressures. If you have ownership and the ability to use other people's money on Wall Street as well as access to uh, uh, private banking, that could be a game changer. So for me – even though most people know me from my entertainment career, and it's something that I'm still deeply immersed in, I've always had an entrepreneurial background. I've always been interested in other business pursuits. And even while a different world was proceeding, I've always had my hand in other entrepreneurial endeavors with friends and colleagues that we've looked at other businesses that we could start and other opportunities that made themselves available. And I, I've always done that, and it's something that's been second nature to me. So that's really what's – that's how I spend most of my time. And, and, and for the most part, I've always wanted to connect Wall Street and Hollywood. And as a producer now, now that I'm producing on my own, part of that challenge is always raising money for, you know, new projects and, and new endeavors. And it's the challenge of all producers, it, either to go out and sell a project to a studio or a network – or to raise the money and produce the project independently. And that is fundamental to, you know, the core of, of my existence since I was a kid. And that's the short answer. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, it, well, well, I'll tell you what. I, I've had a chance to hear the short and the, the long answer to that. And I was, I was really intrigued, um, you know, with – uh, with with your breadth of, of knowledge and and and, and, and curi you know intellectual curiosity uh, in so many different areas, 
And so one of the things I remember you were, you were talking about is you were talking about uh, you know, black people and, and, and setting goals, setting standards for ourselves in terms of what we define to be wealthy, what we define to be successful. Um, and I know one example you mentioned was you mentioned that you had seen a show where they defined wealth and success as, you know, making it rain and, and very hip hop kinds of images. You know what I mean? And you said actually wealth is something very different from that. Success is something very different from that. Can you kind of talk about that as far as, you know, us setting our dreams, uh, at a level that's a little bit too low? Sure. I, I think as a as a general rule, most African Americans, you even say most people, but it's there's more balance outside of our community. So, as for our community, particularly now in this election year, when we're talking about income inequality, for African Americans to uh, uh, um, shape their goals, you should always think in. I, I think. Far too often, African Americans think of wealth in terms of what images have been ingrained in the uh, zeitgeist of television and film. So there's there's no doubt that if we look at some of our athletes and entertainers, they are some of the wealthiest people on the planet. But most people overlook the fact that someone is paying them. And if you want to uh, be, and, and if you eat, take Michael Jordan for an example. Michael Jordan was the highest paid, the highest paid player in the NBA his his final season. But for most of his career, he took less salaries so that the team could put a better team around him. But that salary was certainly made up for in the endorsement deals he had with Nike and others. And then separate and apart when Nike broke off the, the Jumpman brand for Michael, and Michael went from being a player to now being an owner. And that's really the the type of leap that I think most people in our community need to think about. If your your aspiration for what wealth looks like is defined too often by people you see when the people who really are wealthy and impacting your lives, whether it be in politics or business, are people you normally don't see. I always in, in our conversation, I think I even mentioned to you, most people could probably name their top five actors. They could name their top five rappers. They could name their top five films. They probably can't name the top five entrepreneurs on Black Enterprises' top 100 companies. That's the problem. Now, if you say, well, for, for people to have goals and aspirations, I, I, I like to, to, to use the example that everyone knows who Bill Gates is. And routinely, Bill Gates is looked at as the wealthiest man in the world. And I, I said we looked at because I, I gave that an asterisk and come back to that. But when Bill Gates was a college student, he dropped out of Harvard, I believe, as a sophomore. The goal that he and Paul Allen set for Microsoft was to put a computer on every desk on the planet. That's an audacious goal for college sophomores. And what's happened is now there's a computer in everybody's hand. That's why the wealthy has been on the planet because the goal or the or the realization of the pursuit of such a lofty goal resulted in a dream bigger than they even could have imagined. And that's the type of thing that I routinely say to young people of, of color. Whatever your dream is, it's not big enough. Make it bigger. And it's gonna seem out it's gonna seem crazy, it'll seem ridiculous to you, but that's what your competition, that those are the kind of goals they set for themselves. I, I, I saw a, a lecture that was given by an angel investor uh, from a venture capital company to a group of Stanford students. And what he said always it resonated with me because as he lectured to these kids, he said, you won't have to worry about getting a job because all of you are going to create the job that you want. And that was extraordinary to me, just to have that sort of expectation. And particularly for Stanford students in Silicon Valley, they take pride in, in, in knowing that they created almost 80% of the world's wealth over the past two decades. So that's not an unreasonable expectation. Moreover, they are encouraged to collaborate within the colleges. So you don't see the sort of, of 
a narrow focus that if you are strictly in the College of Engineering, that you don't talk to the business school students or you don't talk to the law school students, that you all collaborate and see what it is collectively you can create that might be bigger and better. It, it's one of the, for everyone who ever watched uh, the social network or the, regarded, you know, the fictitious story, which most people say was pretty accurate about the creation of Facebook, the conversation that Sean Parker had with them that they say changed the entire approach to the building of Facebook is when he said millions are great. Billions are what's really exciting. And for, I think, people of color, they need to have conversations like that. They need to have goals like that and know that they're real. You, the only thing that's stopping you is to change your thought process about what's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that, and um, and by the way, uh, I want everybody to know that we're we're doing this through the internet, uh, through Uvu, and and the the internet connection isn't isn't perfect, but you can hear everything Daryl's saying. Um, so I just want to let you guys know that um, that that that's what we're working with. But we we getting this done because I wanted you guys to hear from his brother. Now, um, let me ask you a question about you know entertainment in, in terms of how it shapes the way we view ourselves, uh, the way we view our communities, the way we view our families. Um, how do you feel? I mean, you came, you know, you, your career um, uh, on television, uh, you know, uh, a lot of it was defined during that, what, what people considered to be that golden era for black folks, where the shows were very healthy. They had uh, images and, and uh, motivations that, that seemed to be um, productive. Now things have changed, right? You got a lot of reality TV. You got a lot of ratchet out here. You got a lot of crazy stuff going on. Um, can you, as an insider to all of this, the evolution of television, kind of talk about what you're seeing and, uh, and what we might want to be concerned about? Sure, and I, and I want to reiterate, I, I'm, it's funny, I don't know how to ultimately look because as I'm trying to allow for the, for the delay, I'm trying to provide some space because our conversation would be much more fluid if we were both <laughs> trying to allow for the space. So the, the answer to your question is this. Um, I, do, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't hold it against anyone working in the entertainment industry for getting a job. Getting a job is hard. I don't care what you're doing. Just finding work is a challenge, and that's in front and behind the camera. So oftentimes you will hear people say, I took the job because I needed the money, whatever that job may be at the time. If I needed to feed my family, I took a job. I don't bemoan anyone who takes an honest day's pay for an honest day's work. What I would say is what's a, a, been a popular conversation recently has been diversity. It's a worthwhile pursuit. We need additional diversity within the entertainment industry. But I would, I would submit that there needs to be a greater specificity on what diversity looks like in the sense that the number of faces of color or faces that look different than, main, than the majority of those who run Hollywood, that number is increasing, but the storytelling isn't changing. So if we're not seeing diverse storytelling, that's really the issue. And look, there, there, are, there are no shortages of, of and, and no one is suggesting that people need to stop making movies about World War II. And there's no reason to do that. The great generation, uh, there are surely stories that are triumphant and heroic that we haven't heard. However, in our community, uh, if, we, if we look at the number of stories about all of the pathologies that impact our community, it dominates the, the types of stories that are told. And not that those stories aren't real or valid or worth telling, what we're missing is balance. What we're missing is a balance from stories that are told by people of color that look like law and order. Show me stories from, that look like Suits or Mad Men or American Horror Story. There are all types of really good science fiction just in general. What does the future look like from people of color? It's been a, do you know how long it's been since there's been a film, A Brother from Another Planet? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been a long time. And so these are the sorts of things that we need to really see change. 
And, and there are two things that you could say. When, if, if I were to, to say what I believe the problem to be is, one, everyone likes to win. Everyone likes to succeed. And the fact is that if you, if you tell a certain kind of story that has a hip-hop element that is cool and, and current and urban, these are buzzwords that are popular that buyers react to. So everyone wants to say, look, I want to be successful. I want to sell a project that someone's going to buy and produce, and hopefully we get it done. And I tried to go in, and I tried to sell a project that was about something else. It was a story about, uh, let's say, a black bakery. I don't know. Just pick something. And when I went in, no one wanted to buy it. Or people will argue that there have been stories that have had positive messages, and they were thought to be pedantic and preaching, and, and they were deficient when it came to what is essential in any artistic endeavor, and that's being entertained. So if you want to have something on message that's about positive images, you the, the notion that you sacrifice entertainment or that those two can't coexist, which is not true. They're, they're all, if you look at some of the highest grossing movies, The Jungle Book, uh, uh, Zootopia, these are all family movies that are either G or PG rated, and so tonality is not necessarily or, or you know, the determining factor of whether you're successful. So all of that to say that balance is really what's missing. If we're, if we're able to tell the gritty stories about, uh, uh, you know, our urban experience, we should also be able to tell the stories about, you know, the corporate struggles and the, the, the struggles of law firms or, or at the heck, I've set it off in one of my favorite movies of all time. I just like the capers. Give me, give me the inside story, the Ocean's Eleven, the, you know, um, pick one. You know, we could go down the list of just a balance that represents stories and different storytellers. That's what we're looking for. And I certainly applaud one, my friend and one of the, the biggest advocates for all types of young uh, filmmakers and storytellers uh, is Ava DuVernay. And she has been, for a long time, evangelical about getting people with different points of view and, and, and different types of storytelling out for mass consumption. And you're right. I mean, Ava's work is extraordinary, and uh, she should be applauded for that. And I think, um, you know, generally speaking, I think that just just this idea – that um, that we could do entertainment and and care about something other than just money, you know, like just just that, you know, uh, that you you can make money, get rich, do what you're gonna do, but that cannot be the defining factor of everything you do, because then you're gonna end up doing some crazy stuff, you know. Um, I personally believe that you can you can uh, as they say what do they, what do they say um, do well and do good at the same time. You know, uh, you can build an economy. You can build an economy around destruction, or you can build an economy around production, depending on how you want to pursue things. Or you can build an economy around prisons, or an economy around education. You know, all these things allow you avenues uh, for revenue generation. And so, being conscientious about how you establish that from the beginning uh, makes all the difference in the world. Well, you know what? I've had you for 21 minutes and 20 uh, and 24 seconds of, of, of your time, brother man, and and, and I want to say. Uh, thank you for this conversation, and and I hope that this won't be our last. Um, you know, next time we talk, we'll just talk in person, and I'll just bring a camera with me. That way, people can get the live interaction as opposed to the, the this internet thing that I try to patch together. So, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate you. No, it is my pleasure. Thank you, and I, I too look forward to, to doing this in person. So that way, we'll be able to laugh with each other and not. <laughs> want to make sure that we're not cutting each other off at the same time. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. And, and all right, everybody. Well, you know, this is Mr. Daryl Bell, and uh, I am uh, – I, I will tell you, 
I sat with his brother for for many many hours, um, and, as well as his, uh, his his partner in life, Tempest Bledsoe, and I was so impressed. And 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 uh, we had great conversations uh, about so many important topics. And and uh, I'm gonna bring Daryl back uh, at his convenience because um, I think that we need to hear from multiple perspectives on, on these important issues so that we can form our own train of thinking as opposed to letting the world tell us how we're supposed to view our lives. So um, once again, thank you to our guest, uh, Mr. Daryl Bell, and thank you guys for watching. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from the Black Business School. Make sure you go sign up. You can sign up for free. Until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. We are gone. Peace.